In this video, we will recap on what we talked about in the hall for our first revision session for Lord of the Flies that took place on Friday, the 7th of November. These were the six questions that we used as our benchmark to see how much we had picked up or remembered over the course of the revision session. So at the beginning of the session, we wrote these questions down and you gave yourself an indication with a tick or a cross or a dash as to how confident you felt with that question. Following the revision session, um, we all showed an improvement in confidence levels in approaching these six questions. The reason for that is all of these questions are pretty much asking for what you can make um, largely the same essay. So answering one of these, you could change the title, tweak the content very slightly, and you would end up with a very similar essay. And the information that follows is what leads us to that point. So we'll go back over the information. And then at the end, I'll give you an indication of essay plans that you might use for these questions. So we began by splitting our paper into four boxes and the axes that we were using from top to bottom we had at the top good for the group at the bottom good for the individual and then the left to right axis we had irrational on the left hand side leading up to rational on the right hand side the idea being that some of the themes of this novel you can group them into these areas you can plot them on this grid to help you then understand the different types of leadership and how they are successful and how they are perhaps not so successful. So we began by looking at the top right box, community and civility. So this was all about Ralph and Ralph represents, as you correctly identified, this corner of the box. So community and civility. Ralph thinks about what is good for the group. He constantly thinks about what's good for everybody. And the symbols you gave me to link into that idea, you told me that Ralph uses the conch, which is his way of, first of all, gathering the boys together. Um, in the first place, he calls the boys using the conch. Then they use the conch to emphasize democracy. So the conch enables the person holding it to speak. Um, you also gave me the symbol of the smoke. So the smoke being to Ralph the symbol of home and the symbol of hope, because without the smoke, he knows that they might not be rescued. So the signal fire is um, Ralph's main priority. He needs to keep the smoke billowing from the top of the island. Um, and then you also gave me the symbol of the huts that he builds. So Ralph recognises, again, thinking about what's good for the group, he recognises that they need to have shelter. Firstly, because it's common sense, thinking about rational decisions, but also he's trying to bring a sense of rationality to the camp in that the younger boys, the little ones, have started to have nightmares. They're starting to think that there are bad things on the island. So Ralph's decisions are based in rational, sensible, common sense thoughts that are all about trying to maintain a sense of being civilised human beings. Um, we also talked a little bit about the toilet habits of the boys. So Ralph has to remind the boys to go into the jungle to go to the toilet because they've started to go to the toilet outside of their camp, just by the door. Um, and his argument, which is quite right and rational and common sense, is that we need to make sure we look after ourselves and be healthy and hygienic and not go to the toilet where we're sleeping. So that's what we talked about with Ralph. So looking back at those questions, this is the box. You could write quite a full response to a question about how Ralph leads. It's by thinking about what's good for the group and it's by trying to think rationally um, and maintain a sense of civilization. Next, we talked about Simon and we identified that Simon fits into this top left box because Simon represents faith 
and he represents to a degree um, religion or he's, he's a, a religious figure in himself. So he is still representing someone who is good for the group. Um, Simon thinks about other people, just like Ralph. Simon thinks about others. He thinks more deeply, you could argue, than Ralph does about others. Ralph is very rational. He's very sensible. Simon thinks on a deeper level about others. Simon thinks about their motivations. He thinks about their emotions. Um, the reason that faith and religion is over on the irrational side is because, as I said to you on the day, faith is something that I, I don't have faith or a particular religion, but I think it's an admirable thing to have because to have faith involves a certain amount of having to suspend certain rational beliefs that you might have. So this is why there's kind of a continual conflict between faith and science. I mean, you can, both can coexist, but some people feel that they can't. But faith, you have to have a certain level of um, the, an ability to suspend certain rational beliefs in order to have faith. That's why I think it's something admirable when people can have that and it must be quite a empowering quite an empowering thing to have is a belief that goes beyond what you can see and what you can hear and what you can feel it's a belief that goes beyond now this unfortunately is why Simon when we come to the idea of feeling sympathy for Simon this is why Simon is never going to make a leader um, you were able to tell me, first of all, the mango there indicates the fact that symbolically Simon represents somebody who will help other people. And in the early stages of the novel, he is the one who goes to the highest point of the trees. He reaches up and then he reaches down. He passes the food down the fruit to the little ones. Um, that in itself is quite a religious image to me. The idea of somebody handing down food to the needy people below. You also um, told me the idea of Simon acknowledging, he's the only one really, who acknowledges fully that the beast, the evil is within us. He says, maybe there is a beast, maybe it's only us. And this is where I come back to this irrational idea. Simon puts himself across in a way that confuses the other boys. His, he isn't articulate. He isn't clear. He stutters. He faints a lot of the time. So Simon, when he speaks, ends up being called, as you identified for me, he gets called batty. The boys think he's not right. So Simon's in a position where he could and should be a leader. He should be able to show these boys, this is who you are. This is where the problem is. This is the only beast we need to be frightened of. But because of the way that he puts himself across, people don't want to take the time to try and understand him. And when he says to Ralph, he says, you'll get back all right. I mean it, you'll get back all right. And it's that kind of lovely but baseless sentiment. I mean, how does Simon know that they'll get back all right? He doesn't. And this is why it's difficult, because other people don't have the faith that Simon does. Simon just knows inherently inside he knows that they'll get back all right. The other boys find that difficult. Ralph, with his common sense, rational approach, finds that difficult to believe. And he ends up sort of laughing, um, smiling at, at Simon, almost like humouring him. The other thing we talked about with Simon um, was this idea of his death. He is shown to be a martyr in his death so he dies for his beliefs because the pig's head there we talked about Simon speaking to the Lord of the Flies he speaks to the pig's head or at least in his mind he does and the pig's head says to him the Lord of the Flies says you know don't you you know what will happen if you go down to the beach you know where this ends and so this is Simon showing us Golding is showing us that Simon understands that if he goes down to the beach to tell the boys look it's not a beast it's a parachutist Simon knows he's going to die he knows he's going to die but he goes down anyway 
And that's because he has faith. He has a, a, an inherent belief that he can make these boys see. Or maybe, maybe he has an inherent belief that he needs to be the one who is sacrificed in order for them to see the error of their ways. Now, unfortunately, they don't. Um, but he goes down anyway. He takes himself off the mountain down to the beach. And then he ends up being torn apart literally with teeth and claws he is torn apart by the other boys so he is martyred in his death um the two boys there ralph and simon the main conflict there the main not conflict the main uh, contrast is the fact that often Simon has the best ideas, he has the nice ideas, he's supportive, he's intelligent, but people want immediate, um, pragmatic, obvious material results. And Simon can't give that, he doesn't give that. Then we moved on to look at Piggy and you were able to tell me um, a number of reasons why Piggy unfortunately for him, can't make a good leader either. So Golding has written Piggy to be asthmatic, overweight, virtually blind, not from the same public school background. He has an accent, he has poor grammar. Remember he says them fruit, that's why that them is there to remind you. You also told me about his aunt. So he constantly refers to his auntie when you are in among a group of young boys and you are the one who is differentiated in every possible way you are different to the other boys but especially in the way that you speak and the phrases that you repeat that are largely from your auntie probably you are never going to be able to lead that group it's unfortunate but it's true piggy has the intelligence to lead he has the knowledge to lead Piggy is the one who knows what the conch is. Piggy is the one who explains how they need to go about the fire. Piggy is the one who recognises that they need to choose whether they are humans or savages. But Piggy's also the one that nobody wants to listen to. Every now and again, he comes out with a line that sounds like his auntie. Acting like a bunch of kids, for example. Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to listen to that. They're too busy swimming, eating fruit, going to the toilet outside their huts, setting the island on fire, chucking boulders down mountains, killing pigs. They don't, nobody wants to listen to Piggy. Nobody wants to listen to Piggy. But they should, because he has the rationality that Ralph has, but... Piggy has science and reason on his side. Piggy knows the facts of life. He knows what people are like. And he also knows when to stand up for yourself and when not to. It's Piggy who doesn't vote for Ralph to lead first. He's one of the last ones to put his hand up to say, yes, I vote Ralph as leader. He also stands up to Jack in a way that Ralph doesn't. Now, interestingly, just before we get on to Jack, Ralph is the one who, in a sense, gives in to Jack. He compromises with Jack and lets him be the hunter. Ralph, sorry, Piggy. I don't think Piggy would have conceded a, a role to Jack. But therein lies the issue, because Piggy is more about what's good for the individual. So he has science on his side, therefore he doesn't necessarily see the bigger picture in the sense of needing to understand the outcomes of his decisions in case, in the case of needing to understand other people's emotions, other people's motivations. Piggy doesn't really think that through very much. He just dismisses people as acting like kids or being wrong or messing things up because he knows what needs to happen he thinks that's enough but to be a leader you need to know what needs to happen but you need to know how to get other people to help that become an actuality so the final character we talked about was jack and 
we spent time looking at the fact that even though he is largely leading through fear and savagery, he has a level of irrationality that sometimes is on the verge of a complete lack of control. He is absolutely good for the individual and not the group, because even though he says that he wants meat and he talks about them needing to eat, we know, and you told me, the reason he wants to kill those pigs is not for the good of the group. Great, they get meat to eat, but that's not why Jack wants to kill them. Jack wants to kill them because Jack wants to kill them. He tried, first of all, to kill the piglet early on, didn't get it, was mortified by it, shoved his knife into the tree in anger. This is a boy who his battle is with himself. He's not interested in anyone else. He's interested in him being the one to kill the pig, to be the hero, to be the warrior, to be the hunter. He uses the beast. That's what's represented by the eyes. He uses the beast, the beastie, continually um, to maintain his power. Now, we talked about um, this. You were able to tell me that Ralph says there isn't a beast. People don't want to hear that. Piggy says there isn't a beast. People don't want to hear that. Simon says there isn't a beast, but maybe there is. And if there is, then maybe it's just us. People have stopped listening, Simon. They don't even know what you mean. So Jack capitalizes on this because Jack says to the boys, look, if there is a beast, I'll kill it. And we identified why that's going to be the more successful tactic in trying to get followers. Because if there's something you're afraid of, people don't respond as well. If you say to someone, oh, you don't need to be afraid of that. Well, that's not very helpful. What I want is for you to tell me, look, you can be afraid of it, but I will protect you from it. I will get that spider out of your bedroom. I will speak to that person bullying you at school. You don't want to be told that it doesn't exist or that not to worry about it. You want somebody to fix it. And that's what Jack tells the boys, tells the little ones that he'll do. So what you now have here in this overall table, in this grid, you have got the ability to answer all six of those questions in that you can answer a question on who makes an effective leader and why, who doesn't make an effective leader, who is ineffective. You can answer where the conflict is between Jack and Ralph. Well, there's a couple of ideas you could talk through there, one being good for the group, one not, one having rational, rational sensible ideas, the other one not or at least they're disguised as being sensible. You can also identify reasons why we would feel sympathy for Simon, why we would feel sympathy for Piggy. Um, we also talked about, don't forget, the fact that both Simon and Piggy are killed by Golding. Um, what comment might Golding be trying to make then on faith um, and on science in the face of actual human nature you could say um the other questions were about how the novel is allegorical so we'll look at that one now we did this briefly as well in the revision session but we'll look at that one now and write a short plan so in terms of why the novel is allegorical so allegory comes from um, the greek allos which means other and also agoria, which means to speak. So um, an allegory is basically a, a story that is written almost like a, an ex, a giant extended metaphor. It's a story that has another meaning. So you're speaking about something, but using other symbols, other things. So in the revision, revision session, I reminded you that Animal Farm is an allegorical novel. So it's an allegory of the Russian Revolution. You've got pigs that represent different people involved in that. Lord of the Flies is no different. You could argue that it's an allegory of a number of different things. But just to look at the context um, and Golding's background. First of all, we had the fact that he was um, a teacher in a boys school. So he was fully aware of what boys were like. Um, he also was 
aware of the kind of attitudes that boys had towards this type of adventure story. So having read um, books like Coral Island, for example, by R.M. Ballantyne, um, in those kind of books, the boys were, you know, boys went on adventures in Coral Island in particular. They were stranded on an island. Um, the only threats came from external influences. So you had pirates and invaders, savages. But the boys themselves had a great time. Um, Golding's argument was that this would not happen. This would never happen. He had been through World War Two. He was part of the D-Day landings operation. He would have witnessed the horrors of war. He witnessed the Holocaust. He, he witnessed the atomic bombs that were dropped. So he could see just from his own experience the truth of the matter of what humans are capable of and what humans will do to each other given the chance. He also witnessed the Cold War. So following World War Two, the extended period of paranoia between um, countries across the world, largely America and Russia, the conflict between capitalism and communism, um, the conflict between totalitarian and democratic leadership and Golding is quoted as saying the evil is in us all. He said that man produces evil as a bee produces honey. He believed that left to our own devices, what happens on the Lord of the Flies island is what would happen to all of us. Ultimately, we are bad people. We are a, an evil species or we have the capacity to be anyway. So if we're talking about the novel being allegorical, you can use the grid to identify where Golding might be making a comment on democracy and its limitations. Because remember what happens to the conch. Remember what happens at the end. It's Ralph that's being chased across the island with a, sh a stick sharpened at both ends. So that stick is intended for him. The stick that was sharpened at both ends last time was the stick that they used to put one end into the ground and the other end into the head of the pig that they'd chopped off. So if we hadn't ended the book where we did, if Golding hadn't finished where he did, we don't need to jump too far to think what might have happened to Ralph. So what's he trying to say about democracy? What is he trying to say, Golding that is, about human nature? What do you think Golding felt about different types of leadership? Who do you think he felt um, had the most powerful effective leadership style even if he didn't agree with it so here's where you can draw in these kind of thoughts to answer an essay on how the novel can be seen to be allegorical so the first step in an essay plan before you start writing it is to mind map the topic but because we've now got this grid with our four boxes that's a mind map that will cover as we've seen all six of those essay questions at the top of the video. So you've got a mind map to use now. Your job when it comes to answering an essay is to choose the three things that you're going to focus on in your three paragraphs because you've got about 50 minutes to answer the question. You need to make sure that you choose the three topics that link to the question that you can spend a good 10 minutes on um, each paragraph 10 to 15 minutes really explaining yourself fully thinking about Golding's intention thinking about the characters how they link together the themes the symbols you've got to pack each paragraph with absolutely loads of your knowledge to show that you understand completely how to answer that question in terms of using quotes, um, it's nice if you can remember some, which is why on your grids, it's good to have images there or words that you can just think back to to remember because single word quotes are fine. If you can only remember one word that one of the boys used in a sentence, you can use that one word to frame your sentence. Um, you can paraphrase as well. So if you can't remember the exact quote, you can paraphrase. That's fine, too. Your bus stop answer at the beginning, these are what we're going to be practicing um, as we go on with our revision. You should be able for every single one of those six questions now, you should be able to write yourself a bus stop answer. Um, make it about four, five, six lines. So it needs to be basically a mini introduction 
to what you're going to write about and it should explain the gist of your argument, the gist of your answer. So I've written one on the next slide for you to have a look at. Here's my bus stop answer for the question about whether or not this can be seen as an allegorical novel. Whilst it can be read as a cautionary tale about what humans will do when left to their own devices, The Lord of the Flies can be read in a way that reveals a multitude of possible meanings. Layers of metaphor and allegory can be identified. And here's where I list the things that I'm going to write about. Firstly, the use of the beast to control the group reflects the Cold War and the paranoia that fed the conflict. Secondly, the level of violence perpetrate, perpetrated and inflicted on the Virgin Island reflects the violence Golding witnessed at war. Finally, the contrasting leadership styles mirror those that Golding saw in the 20th century. So the examiner now knows, as do I, that I understand this question, that I know what I'm going to say about it most importantly. And that firstly, secondly, thirdly, finally, that's my contents page. That's my list of paragraphs of ideas that I'm about to explain in length, um, at length even. So what you can now do and what I would like you to do is go back to those six questions at the start and I want you to write your own bus stop answer for each one. And you should be able to answer all of them using the mind map that we've just created, that grid, using the information um, that we talked about in our revision session. So go and have a go at those. And then if you want me to have a look, I can give you some feedback, um, give you an idea about what you might add or um, if you want to write a full essay, you can do that too, and I'll mark it for you. Kate okay, Brilt, so I'll see you in our next session. Thank you.